I guess we are at two o'clock, so uh, I will uh, call this meeting to order officially, our first meeting in January 2021. And uh, before I start on, I've got a couple things I'd like to say. Um, one, I'd like to wish everybody a happy new year. Uh, I'd also like to say to both the uh, council and staff, it's uh, been a real pleasure to serve with you during the challenging year of 2020. And I look forward to continuing to serve our community with you for the coming year. We are already starting off on a challenging path, but I think uh, as long as we work together, we can uh, we can try to do the best, continue to do the best for our community that we all share that desire. Um, the other thing I would like to talk about as well, and I, I don't want to start all of our meetings like this. Uh, we did start a meeting in this, our last meeting in December, talking about a former uh, elected a municipal official who we had lost uh, and I'm going to do it again this meeting. Uh, let's hope that it's not a trend but uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the passing of Doug McClellan uh, who also served on Arthur Township Council for uh, for four years and two years as Reeve as well. Um, similar uh, story to Ivan Suggett in that uh, he had served his community for a number of years in an elected official capacity and certainly I think it's important for us to acknowledge that and uh, we I know uh, I probably knew Doug personally better than I did Ivan but and I uh, certainly remember Doug's ongoing commitment and belief in his contribution to his community and I certainly uh, I think we we need to acknowledge that um, again hoping that this isn't a trend for our coming meetings but uh, I think with that said, I'll try to get things rolling here. Um, so first, first up is the adoption of the agenda. I'm going to suggest that's moved by Dan, seconded by Lisa, that the agenda for January 11th, 2021, in 2021 regular meeting of council be accepted and passed. Any questions or concerns with that? All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to disclosure of pecuniary interest. I have none to declare with regards to today's agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me, Councillor Burke? No. Councillor Yeek? No. Councillor McCabe? None. And Councillor Hearn? No. Okay, thank you. First up on our agenda, are, we have three presentations this morning. Or sorry, this morning. <laughs> it's been a long day already. This afternoon. Uh, first up, we have a presentation from Andrew Coburn from Coburn Insurance in regard to our insurance uh, program for 2021. Uh, if you're ready to go, is you're all set on your end, Karen? I am. Andrew just needs to unmute himself and let me know when he wants me to put the PowerPoint up. Okay. Hi. So, Andrew, Karen. welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Karen, if you can... Uh... Put the slide up there. <clears throat> Is that on full screen? Can everybody see that? Yes. It's all good here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, your honorable mayor, fellow councillors, and uh, if there's any members of the public. Um, as uh, Mayor Lennox uh, had, had opened there. My name is Andrew Coburn of Coburn Insurance Brokers, and uh, I am pleased to present the 2021 proposal for the uh, upcoming insurance term. Um, I'd just like, Karen, can you just uh, press next, please? Uh, next again, I just wanna start off with a general overview of the uh, insurance landscape right now. It's been a, as discussed last year, it's been a very difficult uh, um, time in the insurance industry. Um, the hardening trend, which we started to experience uh, in 2019, um, has continued through um, on, on to uh, this year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, basically we use the terms hard and soft markets in the insurance industry. Um, a hard market is generally one that uh, comes on over time, it's not immediate. Uh, this is not just strictly COVID related, uh, but we will get to that shortly. A hard market is generally brought on by such factors such as inflation, uh, low return on investments, um, severe weather patterns. Uh, insurers will start to restrict their uh, underwriting and then uh, provide rate uh, over and above. So 
We did touch on that last year, um, you know, that the, the beginning of the hard insurance market, obviously this year now coupled with COVID, um, 2020, 2020 has seen a drastic uh, turn of events. Um, there has been um, heavy rate put on uh, and, and reduced capacity by all carriers um, as a result of the hard market coupled with um, the COVID. So we're seeing reduced capacity, increasing rates, and there is also um, a lot of carriers exiting certain uh, industries. As a whole, this is not just pertaining to municipal insurance or even just the township of Wellington North. We're seeing this across the board with several uh, different segments of the industry. Um, with COVID, um, yes, carriers have been affected, uh, you know, as noted here. Uh, lots of third party liability from the pandemic, uh, law enforcement activity, employment related practices, wrongful acts of government officials, and uh, the big one actually is the business interruption. Uh, which we've experienced. Um, you know, uh, the two primary coverages that are impacted is the property and the general liability. Uh, in a soft market, which we've been accustomed to for almost 20 years, uh, insurers will negotiate. Underwriting guidelines are flexible. Um, rates are very, very low. Uh, starting two years ago, now with COVID, we are, it is going the opposite direction. Uh, COVID has brought on... Um, basically uh, not an exponential, but a, a duplication of the rates, which we were experiencing in early 2020. Uh, the, the general estimates right now as a result of COVID are 26 billion in losses coming out of London, England. So we are starting to see the market slide fast. Um, next, next page, Karen. Uh, with regards to the two segments of the uh, municipal programs overall, this is not pertaining to the township of Wellington North uh, yet. This is just an industry as a whole. We have seen the property rates increase for 11 straight quarters. Uh, the most significant, actually coming a little bit before Q3, we saw it as of July. Um, July 1, we started to really see the COVID impact come against uh, property segments are tracking really high rates. Um, a lot of them carriers are, 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 are just making mandatory double deductibles. Um, so if you're used to accustomed to a $25,000 deductible, we are seeing 50,000, if not a hundred thousand, a lot of, a, a lot of instances. Um, we have seen the uh, exiting of a lot of insurers out of the municipal space as well. Um, you know, which has caused a lot of issues with subscribing policies and trying to find that capacity in a, in a, in a marketplace, which has been, there, there's not a whole lot of opportunity out there to find carriers to take it on. Um, we are seeing uh, with regards to, uh, you know, property rates, we are seeing 15, 20% with really good uh, acceptable loss ratios. If we've ran into some losses um, or yeah, if we've had, if we've absorbed some losses and the loss ratios do um, uh, reflect uh, a little under the, the desirable uh, rate by carriers, uh, we are seeing an excess of 50% if uh, renewals are accepted or if renewals are even off offered, sorry. Uh, there has been several that have been um, non-renewed. Uh, next slide, Karen, please. Yep, it just takes a second. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So on to the casualty uh, as a whole, uh, the, the, the pandemic has brought forth uh, a lot of liability uh, with highly scrutinized um, public entities uh, like, like municipalities. Um, there is uh, insurance is evolving. There are some expected coverages to come out of as, as a result of this, but we are seeing a cuticle disease exclusion placed across uh, almost all commercial lines. I will get to this in a bit as there is a nice feature here put on by our uh, liability underwriter. Um, but yeah, public entities continue to be highly scrutinized through social inflation, um, you know, through the joint and several liability clauses, you know, broader contract interpretation, increased litigation, larger jury awards. Um, you know, it's kind of viewed upon as regardless of negligence, somebody has to pay. And that's where it seems as though municipalities get to dragged into uh, more often than what we'd like to see. Um, obviously, uh, any counts on the liability side of things, uh, we are seeing uh, heavy scrutiny. Um, you know, from a risk management standpoint, if there has been claims, um, which in the overall market space, when the syndicates in London are not taking on any new or they're trying to get off some existing can make it quite difficult uh, for any municipalities that have uh, experienced some losses. 
Um, next slide there, please. <clears throat> Uh, now coming towards the uh, township of Wellington North, uh, our, our account here, uh, there are several policies included in the program uh, to correct the uh, township's financial position. Uh, we have the Canadian Council's liability, which is the underlying $5 million liability. We have the umbrella liability policies. Uh, traditionally that were uh, 45 in, two, in one policy. Uh, as of 2019, noted last year, we did split those out into two separate liability layers of 20 and 25 million respectively. Uh, included in this is the property machinery breakdown policy, the automobile insurance policy, comprehensive crime, cyber, and annual low risks policy. Next uh, down there. And uh, the two policies providing accident benefits is the counselor's accident and the volunteer accident policy. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. On to uh, the Township of Wellington North uh, proposal for this year. We are seeing an increase of 19% uh, uh, across the board uh, as an overall um, liability rates. Uh, touching on it first, uh, you know, they've been liability and property in soft markets have traditionally carried very low rates which make it appealing. Uh, unfortunately, when we hit a hard market coupled with COVID, we are gonna to start to see that needle push the opposite direction. Um, admittedly, COVID's caught up. Uh, we are seeing a 24% liability premium increase um, on the liability side of things. Uh, automobile, uh, quite favorable at 4%, uh, which is primarily inflationary. Um, on the, just the cost of claims, but also uh, one additional power unit was added in there, which actually brings it to about a 1% overall difference uh, year over year. Um, property premium increase, uh, there was a 2% uh, inflationary factor uh, applied on all buildings, equipment, stock. Um, there was a 16% rate increase uh, on the actual property rate. Um, there are several factors to this. Again, uh, the previous soft market, um, and uh, obviously the business disruption claims from COVID have played a bit of a factor in this, but also the uh, fire underwriting surveys. Uh, Sovereign General who subscribed on the program uh, for the previous eight years uh, has exited the municipal uh, uh, sector of insurance, uh, thus uh, entering in Zurich Insurance. Um, Aviva Canada has remained on risk um, for 70% of the property, uh, Zurich has came on subscribed for 30% uh, up to, to uh, cover, the, cover the entire property. Um, they use FUS, uh, obviously, uh, I think it's been discussed about in-house, but our FUS rating in this township is not maybe quite where it needs to be or, or where it should be, I should say, but uh, that has factored into uh, a, a bit of the rate as well. So. Uh, Next slide there, Karen. What I've done here is I, I, I've compiled a year over year comparison uh, with this year's proposal with the last three uh, renewals. Uh, you will note there uh, from 2018 to 2019, right through 2021, uh, 2022, you will notice there in the premium net difference um, category, it's the two uh, primary drivers um, is, is the liability and the, and the property, uh, which <laughs> accumulate, uh, I mean, automobile, we have, we, automobile was very, with under intense scrutiny years ago uh, with the AB and the litigation, we've seen a little bit of softening in the auto, in the auto segment, but uh, unfortunately the property and the, uh, the liability has continued to uh, scale in the opposite direction. Um, note in red on the bottom was uh, once we took over the uh, program in 2013, um, you know, uh, we were able to save uh, about 70,000 from the incumbent carrier program. Uh, we are just now getting back up to uh, where we were in 2013, if that's any silver lining. But um, at this point, uh, what we're experiencing is not um, easy uh, by any stretch, but um, there are a few things to point out um, to reassure the program is competitive and to reassure that there is some features in here 
QBE, the liability underwriter, uh, we do, there's a communicable disease exclusion uh, across the board. We actually do have, it's under review right now and uh, subject to a surprise, we do have $1 million of communicable disease coverage uh, subject to a $25,000 deductible. Um, that's, uh, you know, just in the event of something, somebody were or, or an entity were to take action against the township, we will have coverage up to a million dollars uh, with regards to communicable disease, i.e. COVID. Um, there is also, um, you know, when we're talking about deductibles, uh, from my experience, there has been a lot of underwriting pressure on municipalities uh, to double, if not triple their deductibles from 25 to 50, 75 and 100 respectively. We have not uh, had that um, on, we have not had that uh, pressure yet from an underwriter, which uh, can be considered a positive. positive. Uh, there was a flood deductible increase on this renewal, but uh, otherwise there has not been um, any, any drastic pressure from the underwriter with respect to that. Um, you know, as we continue through these hard markets, again, I just want to reiterate, it's not just the municipalities that are feeling this pinch. It is, it is quite a little bit, it, 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 it's, it's across the board, um, to be honest. So, but uh, from a township perspective, I, I, you know, I think from my experience, I, I know there's a lot of municipalities, local municipalities, you know, anywhere from uh, uh, where, where we're at this year uh, at 19%, uh, right up to 65%. Uh, obviously, everybody's, uh, you know, has their own loss ratios, their own instances and occurrences and limits, but uh, overall, it seems to be quite favorable. 19%, um, I understand, is never uh, uh, welcomed, but uh, in marketplaces like this and what we're experiencing, it is actually um, quite favorable. So, uh, at this time, I'd like to pass it over, and uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions or concerns um, brought forth. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, any questions from council? Is everybody too shell shocked? <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm going to wait till the next uh, presentation, Mayor. Okay. Any other? Anybody else have any questions? Okay, I just. I had one, uh, and I think you've already partly answered it, Andrew, and that is uh, around the deductible piece. Um, if we were to entertain higher deductibles, is there savings to be had at this point in time? Uh, as you cl clearly said, and I think everyone agrees, a 19% increase is pretty hard to swallow. So just want to know what the options are. Yeah, it, it is. It is difficult, and I understand that, and I can appreciate that, and it's not it's not uh, a pleasant experience to present this either. Um, but uh, yes, generally uh, when we look at increased deductibles, there is rate uh, reductions. Um, in a hard market, uh, sometimes you have to take, sometimes not take what you can get, but uh, it is something I can inquire on. At this time, I can't provide a, uh, a generic uh, approximate savings. Uh, if we were to go to a 50 or $100,000 deductible, uh, Mayor, but I, I will be happy to inquire on that and I can report back if you wish. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, I have a question just for Adam, if you're on the call here as well. And that's directed at you, Adam, and, and that is, uh, I'm trying to remember what we put in the budget as a provision for uh, insurance increase? I know there was an increase in there, but I can't remember the amount. Can you refresh my memory, please? Certainly. Uh, when we were compiling the 2021 budget, we established a 10% year-over-year increase based on the guidance that was available in the market at that time. Uh, appreciating that the 19 is is north of that. Um, it's, uh, it, it is what it is, as uh, kind of Andrew had alluded to, the, the market is hardening. Um, and I can assure you that I have canvassed our member municipalities and they are also seeing increases in the 12 to 18% range based on the feedback I've received to date. So 
while 19% may not be particularly palatable, it's not out of the realm of what we're seeing in the marketplace and across our, our member municipalities as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Dan, go ahead. I guess, is this, uh, to Andrew, I guess, is this uh, going to be a, a trend, do you think, in the next five years, let's say, or going over the next five years, or are we looking at any possible stability to keep it keep it in line? I understand. Good, good question, Dan. Um, all um, all signs, unfortunately, are are pointing this uh, hard market. Uh, originally, uh, flashback to or rewind, sorry, to 2019. Uh, the hard market was supposed to uh, go right through 2021. Uh, there is the expectation now that uh, 2022, um, based on how COVID does uh, pan out, um, reports out of London right now are stating 52 billion in losses uh, last year. Um, how that corrects itself, when it corrects itself, um, you know, I, it's looking that it's going to be at least another year, if not two, um, to be candid. Sure. Oh. Yeah. Understandable. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we have a recommendation here. Uh, uh, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North accept the proposed insurance coverage for the Township of Wellington North for the year beginning January 1st, 2021. Uh, I have that um, is being potentially moved by Sherry, seconded by Steve. Are you guys okay with that? If so, then uh, we'll open the floor for some discussion. Steve, did you have... Sure. Are we, uh, sorry, Andy, are we going to go through the proposal that uh, was included in the package or? Oh. Um, okay. Thanks, Steve. Did you have anything further you wanted to present, Andrew? Sorry, you're, I'm just having a tough time hearing there for a second. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, are you, did you, <clears throat> did you have anything further you wanted to present uh, today? Uh, that's all I had. We can go through the uh, proposal uh, in detail if you, if you wish. Adam, okay. sorry, Adam, did you include the proposal in the? Yes, through you, Mayor Lennox, the entire proposal was included in the council package, but it was the understanding that it, the presentation was going to be the, the sum total of what was to be presented to council at this point, being that it was in summary basis. But if there are pointed questions as it pertains to the actual policy documents that I'm, I would be happy to uh, let you field those. Um, okay. Steve? I guess um, I don't need to go through it. I've already gone through it a couple of times, but uh, I guess then I will have one question if we're not going to fine tooth comb it really. Um, just with the, uh, the best terms pricing, Andrew, I guess this is more for you. Uh, not that I'm extremely familiar with real estate or insurance, um, but is that that's a popular method for condo uh, rentals and insurance, isn't it? Sorry. Are you able to hear him, Andrew? Sorry, Steve. Can you repeat that there? Yeah, the best terms uh, pricing. That's more in line with condo insurance, isn't it? Not like is that what the commercial market usually uses as well? With regard, like rate, like terms, like yes, yeah. Yes. All right. So I thought that was kind of a, just in an article that I had read not too long ago, it was uh, that best terms pricing was kind of responsible for uh, runaway costs for condo insurance. Oh, okay. Sorry. We're, we're comparing to the condo. Like, are you, are you referring to the condo crisis right now? Yeah. Like not. Yeah. Like. Is that um, what we're using here? Sorry for our policy. I'm sorry, I'm not just quite understanding the question. I, sorry, Steve. I, I think the question is, uh, Steve is familiar with the, the best terms policies associated with condo insurance. And he's asking, is that uh, the same as what's proposed here? 
uh, because his concern is that this has resulted in runaway insurance costs in the condo industry. Is that right, Steve? Yeah. Sorry, you couldn't. Uh, sorry, you couldn't hear me, Andrew. No, no, that's okay. Um, it's hard to compare municipalities with the condos. Uh, condos, the condo crisis of Ontario or Canada, sorry, is experiencing a lot of the same. Uh, you know, rates can only go so low when it comes down to it. Now we're seeing an exodus of uh, pretty much all carriers out of the condominium, uh, you know, uh, sector of insurance, um, you know, or and or if they stay in there, it's three, four, five hundred percent. With regards to, um, there are several municipality. If we're talking best in best in class pricing, it's really hard to discuss best in class pricing uh, in a hard market or compared to other or local municipalities. Because uh, rates change from, um, you know, the only real way to determine whether or not um, it's it's best in class would be obviously to to uh, receive two or three quotes, which I'm happy to do, um, you know. But when it, when it comes down to a hard market, uh, procuring uh, quotes, terms, rates, and ensuring that the the coverages um, are as requested with with the premium, a target premium in mind, is extremely difficult in a hard market. Um, so uh, my suggestion is, is, is oftentimes when, as difficult as it is to digest a, a hard market swing, oftentimes it's best to let the market settle, soften a little bit, and then we can take it back out to market. See if there is a better program out there, uh, there are three which we do have access to here and we have written for and write for um, to ensure that it is best in class. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. No problem. Okay, any other questions, comments? Sherry, go ahead. So we have the recommendation on the floor, but I wanna go back to the comment that you made, Mayor Lennox, about uh, the deductible. Are we going to send it back to review that or are we all just going to accept what's been presented? Or are we gonna okay. have a discussion on that? Okay, I, I, I guess um, my impression was one thing and probably it's a good idea to clarify that, that we would ask for that information for clarification and if there were opportunities, we would still be able to take advantage of that if we decide to go that route for this current year. Is that correct, Andrew, that that's, it, yes. did I assume? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, just to my note here, I was gonna take it back uh, and then circle back with you uh, for a touch point uh, surrounding uh, the potential uh, rate decrease with the, to carry your higher deductible. Okay. Right. If I'm not so that, mistaken, that would give us an opportunity. Sorry. If I'm not mistaken, Adam, this has to be the 18th was the last date we had, so we didn't have a meeting again before then. Is that what the? Certainly, through you, Mayor Lennox, I believe that is the the date that we do have in terms of to securing the the terms which are detailed in this particular renewal. But I'll defer to Andrew for any particular clarification of whether or not that 18th could be extended to enable us some time to mull over a, a deductible change and what that would look on premium. Yeah, I can uh, just touch on the 18th. Uh, historically, uh, a 30 day extension is not the norm, or it is uh, more often than not granted. Um, the, the reason why there is a uh, sovereign, as, as previously noted, sovereign general had uh, exited the municipal space, uh, that hence Zurich coming on. So right now, um, when anytime a new property subscriber comes on to a risk, there is a, um, they are ensuring, they are, they are assuming the risk. Um, so they will often put limits on extensions. Um, so if a claim were to happen just to, to, to be clear, the claim were to happen would, would be subject to the new limits, deductibles, et cetera, uh, at present uh, on the proposal. But an extension beyond uh, uh, the 18th is, it's it, to be, yeah, to be candid, it's, it, it's not available uh, just because they are on risk for something that they may not be able to uh, continue on for beyond. But I can I can go out and get uh, some answers on the deductible to circle back in time prior to the 18th. Um, okay, Mike. That said, Mayor Lennox, uh, perhaps as long as council's comfortable and this will be your decision um, as a group, there could be direction for staff to give consideration to deduction to making amendments to the deductibles 
as part, uh, but I think we're accepting what's being presented, um, but then giving some direction to staff to address what Andrew comes back with, uh, knowing that council does not meet again until the 25th. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm personally comfortable with that, Mike, in that uh, we're going to be relying on staff's expertise anyways to advise us whether that's a good plan to go with or not. So I'm comfortable to uh, extend that discretion. Uh, is the rest of com council comfortable with that as well? Yes, I am. Yes. Dan, you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with it, but I just, I wonder Dan, why ahead. do we leave, why do we leave it so tight? so that we don't have another meeting if there are questions. And I know our schedule dictates some of these things, but you know, I mean, there's a question raised here and we're not gonna have another meeting to discuss it. So, I mean, we'll be told at the next meeting what happened, but why do we leave these things so tight? I, I don't know. Mike? Mike? Through you, Mike. Mayor Lennox, I think Andrew um, explained a little bit in terms of the tighter timeline this year as it relates to the change in the carriers. So that's why it's, yeah, the 18th, which isn't typical. Typically, we have an extended period between the presentation and when we have to, you know, give Andrew his opportunity for the renewal. So it's a unique scenario in that we've lost one of the providers and there's a new one coming on and uh, I'm not the expert and Andrew did a good job uh, trying to explain, but that's why there's a different timeline associated with this year. But certainly, yeah, if council's adamant, then we'll figure out how to address that with Andrew and that's, that's your discretion. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we do have the flexibility. We could convene a special meeting to deal with this if you think that uh, that's important for us to weigh in on it uh, based on staff's recommendation. Dan? Oh, I don't, I don't think we need another meeting. I just, it just concerns me that, you know, this, there's often issues that, that the timelines are so tight that we don't get enough time to, to ask questions or get the proper response. I'm fine with Andrew getting back to staff, giving them the, the, the answer that to the questions has been asked and letting staff make that decision. Okay. Any other questions or comments then? Okay, so seeing none, uh, we'll call the motion then. This will, again, this is uh, the recommendation that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North Accept the proposed insurance coverage for the Township of Wellington North for the year beginning January 1st, 2021. All those in favor? Okay, that's carried. Again, okay. thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. And uh, I'm sure we'll look forward to hearing what uh, you can, the information you can share with staff and how we can proceed from there. Okay. Thank you very much for your everybody. time, everyone. I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 there's still some friction here on my end hearing, but I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to uh, circling back, hopefully with a little bit more better news here. Thanks, Andrew. I'll Thank move you. you out to an attendee. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, next on our list is a presentation from Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority draft budget. We have Jennifer Stevens and Laura Molson. Um, Karen, you're getting them set up to They're just coming go. on now. Okay. Okay, looks like they're on together. Uh, I see SVCA, Jennifer and Laura, so I assume you're both there together or one of you is taking the, the, uh, the duties on. Welcome. Yes. Hello, uh, Mayor Lennox. Uh, this is Jennifer Stevens speaking. How are you doing today? Very well, and yourself? Very well. Um, I'm assuming, Karen, you'll just walk through my slides? Yeah, I'm going to put them up. Just give me a okay. sec. I got to find them again. Don't you hate it when those slides run away? Hey, oh my <laughs> here we go. <laughs> 
Hey, Jennifer. Hello. Can everybody, can everybody see that? Yeah, yep. that's good. Okay. Karen. That's perfect, Karen. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yep. Okay. Good. Yep. Perfect. So thank you very much to you, Mayor Lennox, and, and to the rest of council for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I actually did a presentation this morning and I'm doing one tonight, so I had to make sure my times are correct. Uh, my presentation actually begins on page 33 of your agenda package. I'd like to start by, by introducing myself formally to council. Um, I began with Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority in June of last year. I have an extensive background working with several conservation authorities over the period of 17 years. I've worked directly with nine and I actually worked with Conservation Ontario, the umbrella organization. So I have actually worked indirectly with all 36. So um, conservation authorities are my business. <laughs> um, today, I will be providing you with a brief overview of the proposed 2021 budget, which was circulated to you on uh, November 30th, 2020. And Karen has included it in today's agenda package. As well, I intend to set the stage for a strategic planning exercise that the Conservation Authority is embarking on this month. With the impact of COVID-19 being felt by the public, government, and businesses, every effort was made to keep the increase to the municipal levy low. This draft budget provides a municipal levy increase of 1.6% over the 2020 levy and represents a dollar increase of 27,570. For the Township of Wellington North, the increase in dollar value from the year 2021 from 2020 is in fact $2,875. Next slide, please. I want to give you a bit more context for why conservation matters. Our story of conservation begins in the rural watersheds of Ontario, such as ours, where deforestation for agricultural land uses led to erosion, allowing runoff and flooding, as well as drought. Conservation organizations came together to address the environmental conditions at the time, and the result was the Conservation Authorities Act, which was passed in 1946. And its mandate was to, is to conserve, restore, or develop natural resources of the watershed. After the most famous hurricane in Canadian history, Hurricane Hazel, the Conservation Authorities Act was amended to include powers to control waters, to prevent floods and or pollution. Next slide, please. The key to conservation authorities being able to do our work is the watershed focus, transcending municipal boundaries and potentially different opinions. This makes us a unique entity in Ontario. Good land management equals good water management and one cannot happen without the other. Next slide, please. Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's overall flood management program encompasses both non-structural approaches designed to keep people away from water and structural approaches which are designed to keep water away from people. For example, the flood forecasting and warning program has two important elements. One is to relay routine information concerning watershed river conditions to selected agencies and municipal officials so that they can act appropriately. Secondly, the program allows for rapid advance warning and technical support to concerned officials and to citizens whose lives and properties may be endangered by flood, flood waters. Revenue sources for this department are budgeted to come from general levy at 80% and the province of Ontario contributes a grant of 20%. Next slide, please. The purpose of our water quality department is to establish baseline water quality data to observe trends and to assess the effectiveness of watershed programs. To do so, we collect groundwater, surface water, and conduct biomonitoring 
to help characterize the status of water resources in Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's jurisdiction. For example, we have 29 water quality sites located throughout the watershed and 14 different locations with groundwater monitoring wells monitoring 23 different aquifers. This department is fully funded by municipal levy. Next slide, please. The structural approaches of the flood management program are about keeping people away from the water. These structures include dams used to control the flood uh, flow of frazzle ice, dikes to restrict flows to the proper channels, and channel works to present and per protect slopes from erosion. Existing flood and erosion control infrastructure is inspected annually to ensure their integrity in fulfilling one of their, their key mandates, the prevention of loss of life, property damage, and social disruption from flood and erosion processes. In recent years, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry's annual grant has been decreased by 50% to the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. Therefore, the Water Management Department is is funded generally from the general levy and only by special levy to benefiting municipalities. Next slide, please. Environmental stewardship refers to efforts made to protect the environment and to identify and mitigate the potential environmental repercussions of an activity. Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's programs and services related to stewardship extend to community support and partnerships, project funding support. For example, the authority has recently partnered with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization to create a water well improvement program intended to protect groundwater aquifers across the watershed. Lastly, we continue to maintain and improve outreach to the agricultural community. We use general uh, reserve funds, pardon me, to cover specific project costs related to stewardship. Next slide, please. Through environmental planning and regulations, Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority protects the people from the environment and the environment from the people. The authority ensures that the natural environment and natural hazards are respected, protected, avoided, and or accommodated through our regulation under the Conservation Authorities Act where permits are reviewed and issued for development taking place in vulnerable areas within our watershed. This department will be most impacted by the changes to the Conservation Authorities Act, which were made in December, 2020. General levy, as well as revenue from non-levy sources will support this department in 2021. Next slide, please. The conservation education program is quite extensive at the authority. We assist in the organization of regional events such as the forest and water fest festivals. We carry out local outreach such as the Yellowfish Road program and conduct our own educational programming. The authority assists watershed residents in acquiring the knowledge, the skills and commitment needed to make informed decisions. Funding in this department is approximately 65% from the general levy with the balance being attributed to various program users and to Bruce Power. The general levy required to fund this department is similar to that in 2021 or 2020. Next slide, please. Our forest, forestry and lands department offers three main forestry related programs and services. The tree planting program is the first of these programs and services. The second is the managed forest tax incentive program where Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority provides technical support to landowners um, with respect to developing for a managed forest tax incentive program um, plans. The third aspect is tree marking and tendering programming. And lastly, the forestry related programs and services um, are 
uh, is also attributed to the maintenance and improvement projects related to the 8,000 hectares of authority forested pro properties. The revenue source in this particular department is derived exclusively from the sale of forest products from authority owned properties and from services provided to landowners such as tree planting, tree sales, spraying and forest management. Next slide, please. The parks covered by this portion of the budget include Sulphur Spring, Allen Park, Stony Island, McBeath and Barney conservation areas and Bells Lake and Kinghurst properties. Annual revenue sources other than general levy for this particular department are from agreements with the Ontario Steelheaders Association for Denny's Dam Conservation Area, West Gray for the Durham Conservation Area Day Use Swimming Area, and a rental house at Sulphur Spring Conservation Area. In addition, revenue is generated from parking fees at two parks and from water donations at Sulphur Spring Conservation Area. In 2021, we expect to receive additional parking revenue from two additional property locations. Expenses in 2021 are also expected to increase over the 2020 budget because of an additional staff person who has been hired, the allocation of an increased salary to a new position of manager of forestry and lands, increases to the hazard trees budget, significant repairs and maintenance required for the shops at Sulphur Spring Conservation Area and repairs to bridges at Stony Island Conservation Area related specifically to health and safety of the, the public visiting our properties. And we expect that, that expenses will be offset by a contribution from the Lands Management Reserve in the amount of $35,000. Next slide, please. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that the authority is embarking on a strategic planning exercise this month. This exercise is expected to be complete in tw summer 2021. The purpose of this exercise will be to identify priorities for the Conservation Authority over the next five years, based on feedback from our member municipalities, stakeholders, and the public. Member municipalities will be heavily engaged in this process with both elected members of council as well as staff providing input to this process. As well as setting priorities for the next five years, we hope that through this process, we'll be able to outline successes and weaknesses of, of our conservation authorities operation. With this information, the authority hopes to address these deficiencies and build a stronger organization. In particular, the Conservation Authority endeavors to become an extension of our mini member municipalities where we are working collaboratively to serve the needs of our shared communities. And last slide, please. As many of you know, on December 8th, amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act were passed by the Ontario Legislature. These amendments are expected to have significant impact on some of the programs and services offered by the authority. We are hopeful that the enabling regulations outline, uh, outlining how and in what timelines these amendments are to be implemented will be released soon. The Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority intends to keep our member municipalities informed of developments pertaining to the implementation of the amended Conservation Authorities Act throughout 2021. With that, thank you, Mayor Lennox and Council for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. You're muted there, Andy. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, uh, for your presentation. I'll just now turn it over to members of council if they have any questions. Certainly. Steve? I just got a quick one. And, and thanks very much, Jennifer, for, uh, for uh, that presentation. I know it's, it was a difficult year. And with that in mind, can you kind of ballpark just for the rest of council what kind of revenue was lost just with the pandemic and uh, the kind of the closures and the out of bounds for all the uh, parks and properties that uh, are in the watershed? 
Um, I would say approximately $60,000. Yeah. We were able to um, probably between ballparking between 50 and 60. Um, we, we did have um, uh, a good year at Brucedale Conservation Area, which is one of our um, conservation areas, which historically we would have seasonal as well as um, transient campers. Um, due to the demand for use of, of that conservation area and, and campground, we have now allocated that particular campground as a, as a seasonal only campground. So we were able to, particularly this year where a lot of people didn't want to travel, uh, that worked very well in our favor. And uh, we were able to get people who would not um, be leaving and coming in. And for the community of seasonal campers at that particular campground, that was a good fit. At Durham and, and Sur, uh, Sulphur, or Soggy Bluffs, pardon me, <laughs> conservation areas, we did in fact um, lose um, some, some revenue primarily as a result of um, the, the uh, transient campers that did not come to, to the conservation areas because we had to close a number of sites in a number of different areas uh, within the conservation area and campground so that there was physical distancing between sites. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Jennifer? No. Okay, I don't see anybody else sticking their hand up, Jennifer. So again, I'd like to thank you for coming and making a presentation. Um, and I'd also like to uh, extend my uh, thanks to uh, your, your board and staff for coming through a difficult year and still delivering a pretty uh, modest uh, proposed uh, levy increase. So again, thank you to all the hard work that I'm sure has gone into that. Thank you, uh, Mayor Lennox. I will be sure to uh, pass that messaging along to uh, Laura Molson, our Director of, of Corporate Services. Um, she most definitely had uh, the reins on the budget uh, with my support and um, your, your appreciation is, is acknowledged. Thank you. So with that said, I think we need to move on to our next presentation. Okay, uh, she should be joining us and I will, Karen Chisholm, she's just coming on here now. Yeah, okay. There she is. Hi, good afternoon. You can hear me all right, coming in. Hi, loud. Karen. Hi. Yep, coming through loud and clear. Excellent, so thank you. So welcome and uh, I'll turn the floor over to you for your presentation. Great, thank you very much. Karen, you can um, put the slides up and I'll forewarn you, I had some animations on the last slide and we'll just work through those as best we can. Uh, there may be some, some glitching in this format, so. Can everybody see that? That's good, Karen. Good. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for welcoming me to council today. Um, over the last year and a half, the County of Wellington has developed a climate change mitigation plan. Um, and this plan identifies the energy use in the county, associated greenhouse gas emissions, and provides some recommendations on uh, reducing the emissions and energy use. So today's presentation will provide you an overview of the project and how the county and our member, munis member municipalities can work together to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. The next slide, please, Karen. So climate change in the county, we do um, expect uh, climate to change over time. Um, and I've just thrown up a couple of items here. Um, there are other changes that we expect, but I think these two are, um, sort of the, the ones that we're gonna be feeling the most, and I think um, many people are familiar with. Um, one is temperature. We're expecting an increase in the average annual temperature over time. Um, but also um, when we're looking at some of the data, what we're seeing is there's going to be an increase in the numbers of, number of days annually that are higher than 30 degrees uh, 
Celsius, which um, can have some concerns for heat related illnesses. And we'll get into that in the next slide. The other area that we'll see uh, change is in precipitation. Um, and in precipitation, we'll see an increase in the average annual precipitation um, and shorter return periods uh, for extreme events, which is something I know our conservation authorities are, are uh, keenly watching and modeling. Um, we'll also see an increase in storm intensity. Um, so the storms may be very uh, short in duration, but the intensity will, will increase. Um, and we'll also see an increase in the freeze thaw cycle through the winter. Next slide, please, Karen. So how will these changes be felt locally? Some of the changes that, that we expect to see with um, the changing climate is under infrastructure, um, we may see more road washout and erosion. Um, we'll see increased insurance costs, um, uh, power outages and service disruptions, uh, road closures through because of erosion, but also flooding um, and water main breaks. And that really has to do with some of that free thaw cycle um, and the wear and tear on, on those water main pipes. In agriculture, uh, we expect to see an expanded range of pests, and we're already seeing that on the environment side, uh, where I'll mention it again, where our habitats are becoming more suitable for um, pests and other species that aren't common here or um, are not here currently there as they migrate um, towards the hab these habitats that they can now live in. Um, we'll also experience lower crop yields, and that has to do with some of those environment, some of those um, precipitation changes, some flooding, um, as well as pests, where we're just not getting um, uh, the uh, the yields that that we are currently or have in the past. We'll also see an increase in erosion, which is a, a concern in agriculture because of um, the concern with soil loss. Um, on the environment side. Um, we've already experienced some of the ice damage to trees uh, very recently, um, and that's expected to, um, to increase over time as, as we see more ice um, through our winters. Uh, we'll also see an increase of invasive species similar to agriculture where the habitats are becoming more suitable for them um, to, to live here and, and, and uh, live here over the winter, which is um, a big, you typically a big barrier for some of the species that come in. Um, we'll see increased nutrients and sediment in our waterways, and that really stems from some of that erosion that we're seeing either in our roadways um, or agriculture uh, with those soils and, and other sediments washing into the waterways and carrying those nutrients with it. Uh, we'll also see an increase in, in algae, and uh, this is uh, something we've seen already um, where we have mild uh, winters. It doesn't really kill off the algae or, or um, we have those warmer summers too where that algae just... Um, uh, grows like, like gangbusters. So, uh, so we're already starting to see some of those things. Um, and recreation, um, which may be uh, of more concern to our municipalities rather than the, the, the county um, uh, regarding um, the expense increase in cost to operate ice rinks. Um, uh, we'll also see a decrease in opportunity for outdoor skating, skiing, ice fishing, all of those winter sports as we won't be able, we won't have sustained uh, snow accumulation. And um, we'll also see lower water um, during the summer droughts. Next slide, please, Karen. Uh, so what is climate change mitigation? There are really two, uh, two ways that we address climate change in our planning. Um, one is through mitigation, which is the intervention um, to reduce the sources of greenhouse gases. So we avoid the unmanageable. And then there's climate change adaptation, um, which is adjustments to natural or human systems to a new or changing environment. So manage the unavoidable. And uh, Karen, I think there's an animation here if you wanna click through that. Really what we're looking for in this plan is avoiding that um, unmanageable. So looking at those mitigation items where we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And next slide, please, Karen. So for this project, the county followed the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as partner for project for, sorry, um, partner for climate protection program. Uh, they have this mile, five milestone framework, and the county received funding to complete the first three milestones. Uh, so this is the framework that we use to develop our climate change mit mitigation plan. The first milestone being an emissions inventory and forecast. The second being uh, setting a target. And then the third is actually developing a plan to, um, to address the emissions and, and achieve the, the set target. Next slide, please, Karen. 
so the plan was actually um, developed. It was really um, a collaborative approach to uh, uh, developing this plan. And I was so fortunate to be able to connect with some municipal staff to form a steering advisory committee and uh, the list of representatives there and, and Wellington North, um, Adam McNabb was um, very insightful and gave thoughtful feedback and, and just very helpful in getting some word out when we did some public consultation um, on the plan. We also had a community advisory group and that community advisory group included um, three members at large, uh, representatives from industry, from uh, the conservation authorities, uh, the local utilities, Enbridge and, um, and our hydro companies. We had a, a, a very uh, diverse group um, that uh, provided input, input through that community advisory group. In total, we had just under 480 um, people engaged. In, in the development of this plan, um, which I think is uh, pretty impressive. And I think it speaks a lot to what the interests are in the community, given that we were in lockdown when we did uh, a lot of that engagement. So um, all of that, uh, those efforts were very much appreciated. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. So the greenhouse gas inventory, this is our first milestone. Um, the areas that we looked at, building, transportation, solid waste, and agriculture. Um, under building, what we're specifically looking at is our consumption of electricity, natural gas, propane, and fuel oil. Under transportation, it's gasoline and diesel. Solid waste, we're looking at uh, methane production in our um, uh, solid waste facilities. And in agriculture, we've looked at enteric fermentation, which is a byproduct of uh, livestock digestion, manure management, soil management, and uh, urea and liming application. So the inventory took um, consumption data from various sources and followed some set protocols. Um, in part, it was the Partners for Climate Protection Protocol um, to, and also the um, International Panel of Climate Change Protocols to, um, to determine what the greenhouse gas emissions were associated with these various sources. Next slide, please, Karen. So once uh, the um, emissions inventory is completed, we started thinking about the target. Where do we want to uh, be at the end of the day when, uh, when this plan is completed? And um, so we looked around at some of the um, um, agreements and commitments from other levels of government and some other guidance uh, to set the target. In uh, the federal government um, has signed on to the Paris Agreement, which is a 30% reduction from 2005 levels by the year 2030. Um, and so has the uh, provincial government. Um, so that is, um, uh, that is uh, in a lot of their guiding documents. But uh, federal government has gone even further to say that we're going to achieve net zero by the year 2050. And um, some recent uh, commitments that, commitment was renewed just uh, at the tail end of last year. Uh, the Partners in Climate Protection also provide some guidance to setting a target and their target for, or their recommend, re recommended target for a community um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction is a 6% reduction from a baseline year um, over 10 years. So our baseline year that we've chosen is 2017 data. Um, and that's because we have a relatively uh, complete data set um, for that year, as well as there's a number of other um, data sources that we pulled in um, and guidance documents that reference either 2016 or 2017. So there was a nice alignment there. I think that works out well. So we took these targets and um, it was a bit of an iterative approach going from the inventory to the targets, to the recommendations um, to try to figure out what was um, reasonable to, to based on some of the technologies available and, um, and just our, our ability to actually implement um, the recommendations. So, um, so what I think we'll see in the um, plan is um, something that will align with the um, future goal of a net zero by 2050 um, with some consideration for both the Paris Agreement and this recommendation from the Partners in Climate Protection. Next slide, please, Karen. So this is my, really my last slide. And um, what I wanted to impress is that 
Um, it really does take a village to uh, reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. Municipalities have um, either direct control or influence over about 44% of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. And, um, and so we do have an ability to um, reduce our own emissions, but also influence the emissions um, at the local level. So um, here we just have identified some of these um, players around the table um, and uh, conservation authorities, uh, which isn't given its own spot here, but they do, um, they do play a, a big role and have been considered also in our recommendations. Um, and um, so uh, Karen, there are some animations here if you want to click through those. So municipalities specifically, um, oh, you can click through. Um, one of the ideas that, that we discussed uh, with the steering group and the community advisory group um, is this idea of green building guidelines. This is um, a recommendation um, that comes from implementation of other municipalities and that um, these guidelines would uh, help the uh, development community achieve higher efficiencies than what is currently uh, required through the building um, uh, sorry, the building stand, current building standards. Um, and that would uh, need to have some, um, uh, likely some incentive to go along with it. So that was something that, um, that we've discussed. And I think that's something that um, the county and member municipalities would work together on to, to achieve that, um, that goal. Um, the next would be active transportation. And we have um, the active transportation plan that uh, was developed in, I believe it was 2012. Um, so it is a little bit out of date and that's something that we can revisit. Um, and most of those recommendations are um, best implemented at the local level. That's where we'll, we'll see the, the greatest gains for um, emissions reductions uh, with active transportation. So again, that's something that I think maybe we need to, to take another look at. Uh, Karen, you can click again. Um, development policies. Right now we're uh, undergoing the uh, county official plan and uh, municipal comprehensive review. So through that, there's some requirements to address um, climate change and emissions reductions. Um, so there's likely be more specific policies to address those things, but also um, planning happens at the local level as well as the county level. So there's another area that we can work together on to um, help address some of the um, greenhouse gas emissions um, and to achieve the target. Thank you, Karen. Um, local climate action plans. Some of our municipalities have um, expressed some interest in uh, doing it, following the same um, process uh, at the more local level. And there are some, um, um, some gains to be made there with more specific data to at that local level. Um, there's, uh, because of our jurisdictional split, there are things that um, our uh, member municipalities um, and may be able to provide more specific and tailored uh, recommendation and action on that um, that aren't captured in um, specifically in the recommendations of the county plan. Karen, please. Uh, with many of the actions, we'll be looking for community incentive programs, um, and there's another area that the municipalities and the county can. Um, can discuss and partner on what that looks like, and there's a, a number of. Um, um, funding sources coming out of the federal government particularly. So uh, what does that look like? How can we um, um, use those, those funds um, most efficient, efficiently uh, in the county? Uh, so under the en engineering, or sorry, the Energy uh, Act, uh, all broader public sectors are required to provide conservation demand management plans. Um, and, and I think this is something that the, um, the mitigation plan can help um, provide some insights in the development of these plans in the future. And, and we can use some of these plans, uh, they kind of uh, work together to reduce our energy use and our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Karen, I think there's just one more. And the last being community engagement. Um, the, uh, our member municipalities are more closely tied to the community. And I think it's, um, uh, the uh, feedback I've received to date has been very helpful to better understand the interests and uh, priorities of the local community. And I, I, I hope that, that um, 
um, we'll continue to work together to, um, to tailor some of the engagement um, to the specific needs of, of each community. So with that, I just wanted to, um, to provide you an overview of, of what uh, we've been working on. The plan is currently being reviewed by county staff, and I expect comments from uh, that review this Friday. Uh, so provided there are no major concerns with uh, the plan that we've developed thus far, um, we will prepare the plan to go to county planning committee in early February. Um, and, and barring no concerns, we'll uh, take it to uh, council at the end of February. So your first opportunity to take a look at the plan will be um, when it's attached to the agenda in, in early February for planning committee. And um, uh, yeah, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have um, at this point about the plan. Okay, thank you, Karen. Any questions or comments from council? Steve, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Karen. I just got a quick one. <clears throat> um, the conservation and demand management plans, what does that all involve? Uh, through you, Mayor Lennox, um, the conservation demand management plan, um, it's a requirement under the Energy Act, and, and really it's looking at um, energy use from buildings, particularly, um, both electricity and natural gas. Some municipalities choose to include um, their fleet, uh, fleet energy use as well, um, but I, I don't believe that that is a, a requirement. The county has not included that in, in our plan. So each um, municipality, each broader sector, um, entity has to develop these plans um, every five years. Um, I believe our most recent one was uh, 2019. I think it was just after I started um, that our plan was, was um, developed and, um, and those need to be reported on annually um, what the, the energy use is for each, um, each building that's identified. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions for Karen today? Dan, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Karen, very informative. Um, what what can, I, I know that you've gone through it, but what can the local, like what can we as a municipality do on a daily basis to, to start to address some of these issues? I mean, the target dates are not really, I mean, you know, we're looking at 2050 and 2030. Those those timelines aren't very far away, and unless we really start to take it serious as a as a local municipality, then we'll you know the country will the country will never meet those targets. So what what are some of the things that we should be doing or talking about as a council, maybe, um, to to uh, address address it on a daily basis? and engage um, local residents to get uh, on board. Uh, through you, Mayor Lennox. I, I, yeah, I think I could answer. Um, there's a lot of things I could say to this answer. Uh, so I'll just um, keep it to, I think um, one of the things that um, I'll be working on with the county is to embed climate change action through our, all of our policies. Um, so really looking at um, uh, integration between departments uh, to achieve some of those outcomes that we're looking for. Um, so through procurement policy, providing um, guidance on how to have um, a more climate friendly procurement process. Um, and that may include the um, requirements for um, those that we do business with to address certain climate um, targets and, and actions. Um, so uh, procurement is, is one. We're also undertaking our asset management planning and climate change will be included through our asset management planning as well. Um, so those are two big ones internally, but there are, there are others as well. Um, and I think, um, I guess there's three areas um, that to me will make the most gains. One is in our buildings. So, um, uh, item that's talked about quite frequently is deep energy retrofits. Um, in the county, we have a lot of very old buildings that um, were not 
um, they're, they're not up to current standards and efficiencies. So it's uh, looking to achieve those efficiencies in our older buildings, um, but then going along. So going above that. And so that is going to take first guidance, but also incentive for people to undertake those. The second area is transportation and um, transportation is a, a big challenge in rural areas. Um, typically in urban areas, you're going to say, you know, transit and active transportation. And those are very limited in uh, our setting, certainly and, and most rural areas. So what we're looking at there is a transition from um, uh, um, gas and diesel to electric and there's a lot of options and more options coming um, year over year on what that looks like including pickup trucks which I think um, will hopefully resonate with uh, community members um, so that that's that's one um, area of transportation there's other developments happening with uh, compressed natural gas and things like that for heavy machinery um, and long uh, long haul trucking and things like that um, and then the last is agriculture Agriculture, that's something that we'll be working with the Grand River Conservation Authority in particular, looking at um, our uh, water quality um, program. Uh, there's a lot of uh, crossover between the actions in the water quality program and climate, act, climate change action. And so we'll be reviewing that not, not to um, take away from what uh, is happening on the water quality side, but how do we um, use that uh, to also achieve some of these, these um, climate change goals? Um, is there something that we can do to, um, to identify where both are being um, addressed at the same, at, through the same action? Uh, so there's a lot of questions there that we'll uh, work with the grand on to, to see how we can um, to use that and, and, and elevate that a little bit. Um, so as far as how do we get the community on board, I think there's going to be a lot of education and engagement um, needed to do that. Um, and that's something that we'll be looking at is how to best engage with each of the communities and um, uh, really address their concerns. Um, and I know there's um, some areas of our communities that are going to be very hard, hard to reach. And uh, that's something that we're going to have to figure out some, maybe some innovative approaches to uh, addressing some of their concerns and meeting them where they are. It, does that fully answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, any other questions for Karen today? Lisa? Um, Yes, and, and thank you. Uh, Karen answer, actually answered most of my question, um, but I think I'll, I'll just elaborate it on, on it a little more. And it, it kind of involves me maybe flipping off my hat a little bit, but one of your slides was entitled Working Together. Um, and that involves uh, the Rural Water Quality Committee that you just programmed, that you just mentioned. And um, I do sit on that committee, uh, not as a council representative, but as a representative of the agricultural community, um, which of course, Wellington County contributes largely to that program um, financially. Um, we are, I do have a meeting coming up with them, um, the Rural Water Quality Committee, and of course, GRCA, who um, kind of steers that, um, I think in the next month. And um, you had kind of touched on synergies between the two programs. Um, we have tree planting, um, things like cover crops and, and such. We are kind of, we are reviewing our guidelines in the next month. So I was just wondering whether you had touched base with them and whether maybe um, GRCA had any recommendations coming back so that we can um, perhaps enhance both programs at the same time. To work together. Yeah, through you, Mayor Lennox. Yeah, I, um, Linda Redman, who um, is our representative on that, that committee, yeah. she's, she's my manager. So um, she has mentioned that that meeting is coming up. Uh, we don't have a specific um, plan yet lined up, outlined um, on how to approach that, but I can connect with her again as a reminder to say, hey, maybe this is a good opportunity to come in, at least to give a presentation similar to today, just um, to make them more aware of, of what we're, we're doing. Um, the, the plan will go to uh, County Council, I'm hoping at the end of February. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, we're in one of these stages where uh, we, we want to explore these ideas, but until we have support, we can't fully 
go out and, and start implementing. So, um, so we'll have to see what that timing looks and, and everyone's comfort level with advancing some of these, these things in, in the meantime. Any other questions for Karen today? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. So again, I'd like to thank you, Karen, for coming and uh, making this presentation today. And I think we look forward to hearing uh, uh, some of the next proposed steps and how we can participate in it. So again, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Mayor Lennox, so I think that, uh, yes. if I could bring up, uh, it's my mistake. We should have had a, a resolution to receive the Simcoe Valley Conservation Draft Budget just as, as a show of support for uh, our uh, councillor rep on that uh, authority. Okay. Do you have one prepared for that? Uh, it'll just be uh, that council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority Draft Budget 2021 as presented. Okay. And I would suggest for expedience sake, I would suggest that's moved by Lisa, seconded by Dan. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Thank you. So there you have the endorsement, Steve, to carry forward. Okay, so next up we have adoption of minutes from the council and public meeting. So a recommendation here moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry, that the minutes of the public meeting and regular meeting of council held on December 14th, 2020 be adopted as circulated. Any questions or comments in regard to those minutes? <clears throat> okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. I don't think we have any business arising from previous meetings today. So we're on to our items for consideration. And so we can pull out those items we want to have some further discussion on before we approve the others. So I'll open the floor for anybody to suggest uh, some topics they'd like to talk about. Steve, I see your hand up. You're muted, by the way. Sorry, I was just trying to clear my throat before I uh, unmuted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind. Um, uh, Dale's report on page 85. Okay, that's 2A. 2A sorry, yes. Uh, wastewater treatment sewage allocations on page 200. That's 4B. 4B. Yeah. And the uh, off road vehicles as well, please. 5A. That's 5A. Okay. Anybody have others they'd like to uh, discuss today? Lisa, go ahead. Um, and my screen just closed out, so I don't <laughs> don't have it in front of me. But uh, the IT report from um, Adam. Okay, that's three uh, <laughs> B. Okay. Any others? Anybody else have others? Okay, so just a recap, then we're gonna pull out for further discussion 2A, the Community Improvement Pro Program Report, 3B, the Report on the Municipal Modernization and IT Service Delivery, 4B, the Ops Report with regard to granting sewage allocations, and 5A, the uh, report with regard to uh, the changes in off-road vehicles on municipal roads. Okay. okay. Any others? Last call for any others? Okay, so that brings us to adopting the others. I'm going to suggest that uh, this is moved by Dan, seconded by Lisa, that all items listed under items for consideration on your January 11th, 2021 council agenda 
with the exception of those items identified for separate discussion, be approved and the recommendations therein be adopted. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. So that brings us back to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 2A. This is in regard to the community improvement program. So we have a recommendation here, uh, moved by Sherry, seconded by Steve, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive report EDO 2021-001, Community Improvement Program, and further the Council approve a $2,203 facade improvement grant to Eclectica, the gift store, at 147 George Street in Arthur, and further the Council approve grants totaling up upwards to $10,000 for Fister Farms located at 8462 Line 6 Kenilworth. Uh, before I open the floor for discussion, uh, Dale, uh, do you have anything you'd like to highlight before we get to questions? Thank you, Mayor Lennox. Um, through you to Council, just a couple of quick things. One, if we just go back to the prior presentation on uh, on climate change, Council may recall that one of our programs in 2021 is to do a refresh of our community improvement program. And one of the things we'll be looking at is to possibly put in programs focused on energy efficiency, climate change sort of initiatives. So Councillor Yate, to you, one of the things maybe we can do is um, to help accelerate this is, is with some incentive programs through the Community Improvement Program. Um, as far as the specific report goes, um, it's the first one out of the gate in, in 2021. We had a very successful year last year and thank you to Council for uh, your support to the program. Um, this one, the, uh, the first one in this report is, is pretty standard, is pretty consistent with our, our normal uh, ones for facade improvements. The second one is a unique um, proposal um, and it's one council will recall that a couple of years ago, we extended the community improvement program to uh, support agra uh, businesses um, not in terms of building barns and stuff like that, but where they have a retail presence or where they're getting in the agri tourism business or the agri food business, then they qualify for funding under the community improvement program. And so this one fell in under that category where they're looking at expanding this once it's operational to include agri tourism. They're hoping to do some workshops um, and have a retail space included in it. So. That's just a little bit of a background on it. And mm -hmm. Councilor McCabe, I know you raised this one. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, thanks, Dale. Open the floor for questions. Steve, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I think uh, you uh, stole my questions, <laughs> Mayor Lennox. So thank you very much for answering that already, Dale. I just really wanted to highlight the, uh, the Fister Farm. I think this is really uh, a neat opportunity, a unique opportunity for our, uh, mm -hmm. for our municipality. and. Uh, fully support something like this and hopefully uh, it's the, the start of many more. Okay. So thanks, thanks. for highlighting that, Dale. Thanks, well, Steve. Anybody else have questions in regard to this report? No. Uh, I guess I have a question. I'm not seeing anybody else. Uh, and I'm, you know, uh, I support uh, the recommendation. Dale, I, I have to admit that this is our first meeting in, in 2021. We haven't even approved our budget yet, but uh, the, the thoughts of one candidate getting $10,000, I'm wondering what impact that'll have on our, our community improvement program budget for 2021. And are we going to have to start turning more uh, applications away? Would you like me to respond to that, Mayor Lennox? <laughs> I think, Please. yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, our funding um, doesn't get paid out until the project is actually completed. So in this case, we're probably looking closer to the end of the year before this project would be completed. Um, and yeah, it's always a risk in terms of running out of funding. Last year, we did in fact run out of funding. Um, council again this year approved $35,000. 
Last year, um, we had to come back to council and you approved another $35,000 so that we could continue to approve applications. Um, and that would be the process again this year. Um, even though this is funding, I think the key words is up to a maximum of $10,000. There's about four different programs that fall or four different funding buckets for this application. Um, I don't think they would probably max out on any one of them. So I think at the end of the day, the funding would probably be less than $10,000. But again, that'll depend on uh, how it actually moves forward. But it certainly is a risk in terms of the budget. But uh, I think it's a, a good risk and one that we can manage throughout the year like we really like council has been able to do for the last number of years. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess my concern is uh, we haven't really tackled the issue where, you know, um, we extended additional funding last year, which was great. Um, but I see this program continuing to ramp up in terms of number of applications. And I'm just concerned that we're going to get to a point where uh, we're going to have to set some priorities around this. And then uh, how we go about setting those priorities, I see as a challenging thing in terms of making a decision of when to say no or when to say yes, but uh, maybe not quite as much as somebody applied for. So um, I'm happy to support this recommendation, but I think that's something we need to think about as we go forward as to how we're going to sort through this if it continues to grow like we've seen in the last couple of years. And Mayor Lennox, uh, through you, I think um, really good comments. And I think with the, um, I'd indicated we're going to refresh our existing community improvement program. And maybe as part of that process, uh, we will also refresh the, the application and intake process. And maybe that'll help us to address some of this, some of these sorts of things moving forward. And I can bring that back to council with some recommendations around how we how we might want to be able to do that moving forward okay thanks dale any other uh, questions or comments before we proceed with this okay all those in favor that's carried thank you and that moves us on to 3b um <clears throat> I have a recommendation here uh, moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive report TR 2021-001 being a report on the Ontario Municipal Modernization Program, an IT service delivery review, and further that Council endorses the recommendations detailed in the Black Line Consulting Report and direct staff to implement the detailed recommendations as feasible. And with that, uh, maybe I'll let Adam have a go at this first, see if you have anything you'd like to highlight, Adam. There's a lot of information in that report before we open it up for questions. Certainly, Mayor Lennox, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk a bit about this particular report and the program. Um, initially, this had come about by collaboration uh, through an application process by MMAH. Uh, whereby they had funded us uh, to go to market to engage a third party consultant to review um, both the internal and external works uh, from an IT perspective from ourselves and a number of member municipalities. Uh, it proved to be a very good uh, collaborative effort in the sense that a lot had come to light uh, in terms of opportunity, um, uh, both for Township of Wellington North independently, but also how to collaborate, collaborate better as a larger group uh, to glean some economies of scale and perhaps some enhancement, uh, both through service and opportunity. Uh, with that, uh, the end result being a number of opportunities identified in the report from Blackline, uh, the least of which would be the opportunity to pool our resources from a purchasing perspective. But at it, in its greater sense, the opportunity to work more as a consortium as opposed to independently to ensure that we're receiving both uh, both the best dollar value uh, for our IT spend uh, and the increased enhancement, both uh, from a security, but also a resiliency standpoint. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Um, with that, I'll uh, throw that open for questions, comments from council. Any 
Anybody got some questions? Go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, I didn't originally ask to have this pulled. It was on my list. My question um, to Adam is, how will this moving forward with uh, the procurement uh, and or purchasing, how will that affect um, shopping local, I guess? Uh, through you, Mayor Lennox, uh, and a great question, Councillor Burke. Um, it remains to be determined how that will impact procurement from a shop local perspective. Um, but the caveat to that is before we can have any real inroads into economies of scale from a savings perspective uh, as it pertains to procurement, uh, there there is a lot of... Uh, lead in work that needs to be developed first in terms of standardization. Um, we, uh, each of the member municipalities that did participate in this review was subject to uh, a bit of a, a deep dive in terms of our current processes, who we procure from, what specs our, some of our IT equipment is. Uh, and in order to glean some of those pooled procurement opportunities, we will need to determine uh, a set of standardized specs um, some of which may or may not be feasible uh, for us, given our unique circumstances, being that we are a little bit, a little bit more remote uh, from a rural standpoint. So some of the IT infrastructure might not be such that we can um, go down that road from a pooled purchasing perspective. Uh, so it, it does remain to be seen in terms of what impacts that will have for us independently and some of our vendor network. Any other questions? Go ahead, Lisa. Not really a question. I think, I mean, I asked to have it pulled because Adam, you worked so hard on this. Um, you deserve just a ton of credit. I think you've answered all of the questions, I mean, that I had within the report. Um, I just wanted to credit you. I mean, there's such a ton of money to be saved here and not just money, but um, making us work better, right? So I just wanted to make sure that you got credit for that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? And I guess Lisa stole my thumber, I, thunder, I did want to uh, Thank you for your leadership on this, Adam. I know you kind of led the initial uh, discussion with the county and other member municipalities, and uh, uh, this this uh, report kind of strikes me as kind of high level, and we've got to really get down to the nitty-gritty detail to figure out how we take advantage of some of these opportunities. And on a similar uh, vein to Councillor Burke's comment, one of my concerns, too, is that uh, because of our and I'm not a big fan of this, but more remote location or uh, timeliness of response uh, to our needs is also a major concern to me and making sure that our suppliers are able to respond to us in a timely way and that we're not uh, relegated to a lower priority depending on how this unfolds. But I'm sure you'll be very uh, diligent in making sure we don't end up on the bottom of the list. Or, or make decisions appropriately. Well, thank you, Mayor Lennox, and uh, appreciate and the kind words. And with that said, uh, I, I appreciate the kind words, but oh. uh, truly was a collaborative effort. And just to, having the opportunity to work with some of our member municipalities to identify some of these things and kind of increase our network as it pertains to that, um, much more than just a, a cost savings. Uh, procedure or initiative. I think there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to increase our collaboration efforts um, and glean some real efficiencies um, going forward from a strategic perspective as well. So uh, thank you very much again for uh, the words. So no problem. I, I know that one of the things that I see and has obviously been part of the discussion is around cybersecurity. And I mean, we all hear the horror stories of what's happened to other municipalities. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I I'm, uh, feel a level of unease with my technical savvy to feel comfortable that we're protected from that. Uh, but, and so yeah, collaboration, if we can get the right resources to protect ourselves uh, from that, I think is extremely valuable. It's hard to put a dollar value on at the, uh, at, a, at the upfront stage, so. 
Um, Any other, Steve, go ahead. Sorry, just uh, just as you said that, Mayor Lennox, I kind of popped a uh, question popped into my head. <clears throat> Collaborating is great and I'm all for saving money and finding efficiencies, uh, but with cyber attacks and stuff like that, if we are collaborated and all tied to one another, does that make us more susceptible to hits? You want to tackle that one, Adam? Anyone can I, get I, on I can that? try. Um, I don't think working as a, a collaboration or a consortium uh, in this regard paints a bigger target on our backs, uh, to be completely candid. I think being able to share resources, know-how, and technologies that does afford us certain uh, ability to layer our securities. So I, I wouldn't view that as a, a, like a predominant threat, per se. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll call the motion. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So we're now on to 4B. <clears throat> this is in regard to the ops report to grant sewage allocations. And moved by uh, Dan, seconded by Lisa, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive a report. Ops 2021-002 being a report to grant sewage allocations and further that council commit to allocating 190 sewage allocations pursuant to the sewage allocation policy 012-19 as follows to uh, the Eastridge Landing Phase 3, 47 units, Eastridge Landing Phase 4, 56 units, Forest View Estates um, for 50 units and Sea Waves home for 37 units for a total of 190. And further that the sewage allocation units expire 36 months from the date of the signed sewage allocation agreement or 40 months from the date of the resolution, whichever is shorter, after which time the allocation are returned to the Township Sanitary Reserve and distributed at the discretion of council. And further that the Township Council direct staff prepare sewage allocation agreements with each developer consistent with the current sewage allocation policy to be authorized by the mayor and clerk. Open the, do you wanna have a go at this one, Matt, before we open it up to questions? Yeah, um, yeah. If, if you'll give me the opportunity, Mayor Lennox. Um, yeah, this is kind of a, it's a good news story as it relates to substantial completion being achieved for the Arthur Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, Council had previously made a commitment to these developments to enter into an agreement um, and the agreement will be new to staff and that's kind of why there's that four month window for staff to figure out exactly what said agreement looks like. Um, but yeah, it's really, this is just a um, making very explicit, I guess, what was part of a policy that was passed in March and um, I think from a staff standpoint, there's still some uncertainty re regarding what the actual sanitary allocation agreement or the sewage allocation agreement will look like, but we'll, uh, we'll work through that. And that's kind of why the wording of the resolution is the way it is, but op open to questions as well. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Any, any questions or comments? Steve, go ahead. Sorry, I just have a, a few. I don't know if it's for Matt or for uh, Darren. Um, with the uh, sewage allocations, is that all we're going to uh, allot for 2021 of the 190? Okay, who wants to field that one, Matt? Yeah, so um, through you, Mayor Lennox, the, the way the policy is written is that April is kind of the decision um, decision month, but um, I understand there might be some want from the building department to to have the, I think the building department could have 20 units allocated to them. Um, and in Arthur that, yeah, that could be very valuable, but I'll let Darren speak as it relates to, uh, to that aspect. But the policy for sure speaks to um, April being kind of the decision month, if you will. The reason this is coming forward now is substantial completion or substantial performance or whatever they call it. Okay. The, these, these ones are just kind of catching up with the pent up demand from the, the freeze that we had on previously, correct? 
correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, through you, Mayor Lance. That's my that's my belief. Yes. Yep. Understanding. So you to continue on, if uh, if I'm allowed. So we had a big presentation from Cache Homes. Not uh, I guess it was the, I don't even know if it was the last meeting we had in December. Or seems like a while ago. Um, and they had over 300 houses, and I think they're going to come back to us. So if they came back in this year, where would that leave them for this year? Okay, I, I, who wants? I see both Matt and Darren with their hands up. Matt, you want to go first, and then I'll switch it over to Darren. Yep. Uh, yeah. Through you, Mayor Lennox. I would say that based on the way the policy is written, um, if Cache had like we'll only have about 200 units left after this, after this handout. So, um, and consistent with the policy, we're only putting out um, a percentage each year. So it would, it would limit the amount of houses that Cache would be able to build if we're, if we're going to remain consistent with the way the policy is written today. Okay. That's kind of what my, I guess, driving point would be so not that uh, I want to give them all out today. Would uh, uh, communications to Cache to let them know that this is what's happening, just so they don't come back and like they have too many houses that they want to allot for one year? Or how do we communicate with them? I, I think, Steve, we have communicated that and staff have communicated that clearly. I mean, they are aware of our policy, it's fairly clear in there that. Uh, you know, the, we aren't giving it all away in once. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to, we have talked about the risks we see to our community and our ability to keep up with building infrastructure. Uh, to do that, I don't think it should come as a surprise to them as they're doing it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm sure staff will continue to uh, tell that story because we do have the policy in place, and and uh, certainly uh, that's part of the intent of the policy. Yeah, and I, I of course want to stay on, on with that policy, but uh, I, if they were coming back to try and do something this year, it might shut them completely down. So that's... Right, and I, I think that's a risk that they take on when they yeah. approach us. Okay. Darren? Um, yeah, just uh, I guess to add to Matt's comments is that uh, some of the developers that have been working with us uh, in getting working towards their approvals um, when they're moving forward they'll need to consider things like phasing their developments um, and and that type of thing until phase two of the plant uh, the sewage treatment plant is uh, is basically approved and up and built and up and running so but but yeah um, the developers that are kind of in the hopper are, are aware of that thank you okay any other Darren, or sorry, Matt, I see your hand up. Yep, um, through you, Mayor Lennox. The only other comment I would make is that, um, you know, I think council has some discretion as it relates to how the developments that are in this, the 190, if there's a phasing to them. Um, so like I say, we're still working out exactly what that sewage allocation agreement looks like, but um, I would think stage three of Eastview goes forward before stage four, and maybe that would be a reasonable provision in the sewage allocation agreement between um, Eastridge and the township. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, Mike, I see your hand up. No, I, I was going to suggest Darren first, uh, Mayor Lennox, if possible. Okay. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Darren. Yep, thank you. Um, just in, in addition to, to what's being requested for allocation, um, I'd like Council to consider um, some allocation for infill to deal with some of the, uh, the one-offs when uh, people are applying for building permits. Um, to deal with uh, additional apartments in the, in the downtown is, uh, is where we've been seeing the most of them. That's where the, the 10 from 2020 mostly went, um, just to, to alleviate some of that. Um, 
is I would suggest possibly 20 units. Okay. Uh, Karen? So procedurally- Did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Procedurally, I would suggest you approve, uh, proceed with Matt's recommendation as it stands, and then a, a suggested standalone resolution would be that the Council of Township of Wellington North pursuant to section six of the sewage allocation policy, grant the building department 20 units of the uncommitted sewage allocations per system, 20 units for Mount Forest and 20 units for Arthur for infill lots. And that wording is specifically taken out of section six of the sewage allocation policy. So it's in the policy it's provided for. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I'm just trying to get my head around uh, the policy process. This, these, this group of four developments is really uh, catching up and then a little bit outside of the policy direction. Uh, will we be coming back in April and revisiting the, the allocations um, for both Arthur and Mount Forest for any further applications at that point? And I guess additionally to that, um, do we need to deal with the infill allocations right now, or is that something we wait for for the future? Uh, you know, when we come back to revisit the decision around the policy. Um, Darren, do you want to go first? And I see Matt's hand up. Um, yes, so uh, we will. We can anticipate um, a further uh, report coming to council in April per the per the policy that'll deal with. Uh, um, other developments for both uh, Arthur and Mount Forest. Um, and, uh, and at that time we can um, readdress uh, the infill. Um, we can either increase or reduce that number um, if needed. Um, I'd like to not wait until um, April. I do have some, uh, some pressure right now for some buildings that are under construction in Arthur that uh, that would like to add additional units while they're uh, while they're renovating. Okay, Matt. Yep, um, through you, Mayor Lennox. My my comment would be that I think the 190. I think the 190 we've kind of or council sorry has kind of pre-approved and. I don't think there's a ton of risk to approving what Darren's request is, although that wasn't part of my part of my recommendation. But I don't. I think we're gonna have. I think we have 20 lots, or I think we have 20 sewage allocations in each community. So I think it's it's very low risk. The way the policy is written, though, we it'd be beneficial to wait till April. I think there's really no risk, though, if council decides to to approve that, and if Darren's asking for it. You know, it probably keeps things flowing a little better from a building perspective. Okay. <clears throat> um, I guess then the question is, uh, is that something we need to, and maybe it's too early to ask the question, but is it something we need to consider in terms of a review of the policy with regard to timing going forward? Matt, go ahead. Yeah. Um, through you, Mayor Lennox, I would suggest that if council was to direct staff to come back with another revision to this policy, that wouldn't be completely inappropriate because we're still working through exactly how this policy works in real life. Um, so I don't, I don't think I wouldn't, I wouldn't take offense, and I don't think anyone from staff would take offense if um, if council was to. Provide, provide some direction to staff to come back with a, a revision to that policy. Okay. Mike, did you want to uh, weigh in? Yeah, I was just going to clarify as it related to, to the infill piece. The way the policy is written now, it basically gives Darren some authority to bring those requests uh, kind of on a one-off basis and not just necessarily the April. But that, again, to Matt's comment, we are still trying to work through this policy internally. And yeah, the idea that the policy should include the agreement, at least a template of an agreement so that council can understand what that agreement looks like 
is not a bad idea either. So we, we think that that's something that needs to be addressed. The idea of addressing requests uh, on a one-off basis, um, which is the way the policy kind of reads now, new development, let's say, um, is going to be really challenging. Um, we knew that at the time we brought the policy forward, and I don't think that has changed. And uh, Councillor McCabe's comments around cache are yeah, timely. Uh, there will be developers outside of cache too that will come forward and look for allocations um, because, yeah, that's what they do. They want to build once they have the planning approvals in place. But we, as a municipality, made the decision when we made the decision to expand in Arthur that we saw the value in um, not containing growth, but having control in terms of what that looks like. And this has been our big, this is the, now we're at that point. Um, and yeah, the 190 uh, uh, also makes me very uncomfortable, to be honest, in that we're kind of yeah setting that aside in the hopes that those developments go forward and they don't necessarily they could or they couldn't, That's we, but we always know that risk going into developers. And that's why we've limited at least the timeframes. Uh, historically, many years ago, there was no timeframes attached to sewage allocations, but at this point we're suggesting 36 months, which I think is generous, but um, is certainly achievable by both parties um, in terms of an agreement once, once we provide those allocations. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So I think uh, we have a motion on the floor already, which deals with the 190 units. And then we have the potential uh, proposed uh, resolution. We can follow that with the Karen outlined with regard to the infill. Um, I guess now if we have concerns uh, with regard to maybe concerns isn't the right word, but uh, refinements we would recommend making to uh, the policy to make it work better. Uh, if we want to give direction to staff, now would be an appropriate time to, to talk about that as well. Um, I personally am happy to let staff kind of see how this plays out and suggest ways to make it work better as we go forward. But uh, I'd be happy to hear from other members of council on that as well. Anybody have anything they'd like to add? I'm good with what you suggested, uh, Mayor Andy. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else have any thoughts they'd like to share? Looks like you're talking, Sherry, but for some reason I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No? No, I can, yep. Okay. I don't know what's yep. going on. Yep, thumbs up. Okay. Everything's, everything's froze up. So I'm okay with letting staff decide, and if they have to come back or bring one offs or whatever the best decision is, uh, sounds like it might be coming back in April, so I'm okay either way. Okay. I go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'm okay too. I think staff, if they want to, if they're okay with taking it back and trying to refine it a little bit, then I, I'm okay with that too. I think it's going to take a little bit of juggling as we move forward here uh, with all the kinds of large developments that uh, <clears throat> are possible developments that are coming that it, it may take a bit of adjustment as we move. On. Yeah. And I think it will be a tricky balance too, to try and maintain the integrity and intent of the, the policy and deal with those one-off requests would be really, really hard. Sure. Uh, so I think I think we need to try to, at the front end, refine the policy as much as possible to make sure that when those pressures come that we're better prepared to deal with it. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm, this is my last call for any further comments and then we'll deal with the resolution that's on the floor and then I'll follow that up with the, the one Karen proposed. Any final comments? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> Karen, could you uh, read that proposed uh, 
resolution for us. Uh, it would suggest that maybe Jerry would move it and Steve would second it. The Council of the Township of Wellington North, pursuant to Section 6 of the Sewage Allocation Policy 012-19, grant the Building Department 20 units of the uncommitted sewage allocations per system, bracket 20 units Mound Forest, 20 units Arthur, bracket for infill lots. Okay, thanks, Karen. Any discussion on that one? We've kind of already been around, but anything further on that? Okay, all those in favor then? That's carried, thank you. All right, that brings us to 5A. Uh, this is the report on uh, the uh, off-road vehicles. So a motion, uh, recommendation here moved by Lisa, seconded by Dan, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North Receive for information report CLK 2021-001 being report on off-road vehicles on municipal roads. Open the floor for questions or comments. Steve, go ahead. Um, I got a, a couple of questions, just maybe for clarification of, of this whole new guideline. Um, so we don't pass a bylaw and off-road vehicles are allowed all over the municipality. Where's the on, county? On roads. On roads. Oh, sorry, yeah. Where are the, uh, where's the county with their county roads? And then where's the province with their provincial roads? So through you, Your Worship, uh, there are some provincial roads that off-road vehicles are allowed on. Uh, there's others that aren't. I, the county has not um, passed a resolution to my understanding, I'm sorry, I'd have to follow that up. Uh, so if you don't pass a resolution, they're permitted on the roads. Right. Okay. That's my understanding as well. If, if they're a listed municipality. Yes. In, yeah. the, in the regulation. And I don't, I don't, I don't believe the County of Wellington is a listed municipality. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Under, under 803, Andy. Yep. I don't believe the County is on that list. I, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe they are on that list. I think there will be further discussion at the county about this, but there's uh, there's disparities across the county in terms of which municipalities are already listed under that regulation and which ones are not. Uh, so I think there probably needs to be a little bit of clarity happen before we get to that to, okay. so that we can have a county-wide discussion about right. that. And then I guess my... Uh... Sorry, Andy, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, so that would be all roads in uh, Wellington North. All Wellington North owned roads, yes. Okay, good. All right, thank you. And uh, I just checked the OREG and the mayor is correct. Uh, Wellington County is not in that OREG. Hmm. And as I'm sure you probably heard in the news and so on, the town of Minto is not listed in that regulation, neither is the town of Erin. <clears throat> so, and I think there, there will be some discussion among other municipalities in the county as to what the appropriate response to this is. Um, I personally am prepared to wait and see a little bit, but yeah, this discussion about whether to be allowed on county roads is an issue that will still need to be discussed at the county again since this regulatory change. Yep, that's what I figured. Okay, thank you. And just for a little Sherry, bit. I saw you had to. Yeah, that was Sorry, my, go ahead, Karen. That was my question is, uh, so it's just on, it's in Wellington North, but a vehicle still can't go down County Road 16. Correct. Okay. So I'm okay with passing the report the way it is, as long as we're gonna come back and have a discussion about this, because I've already had several people reach out to me uh, from the article that was printed from Minto um, that don't support this. So as long as we're gonna come back to it, I'm okay to just pass this as information. Okay. Um. So I, 
yeah, I don't know that there's a trigger right now to for it to come back to us unless we identify a problem that we need to address. Um, or, you know, depending on what happens at the county or our neighboring municipalities may influence our decision. My comment about playing, a, you know, taking this as a wait and see approach was to see how that develops and that may change what our policy response might be. Um, I think there may be some restrictions we want to consider in the future, potentially, if, there, if there's abuses of this privilege. Uh, but I don't personally don't want to see us rush into presupposing what those conditions might be. Uh, so I think it, it will be uh, part of our role to decide at what point, if we would need to in, invoke further restrictions, at what point does that happen? I'm not sure that I've addressed your concern directly, Councillor Burke, but I just kind of want to clarify my own position on it. No, you haven't. Um, my, <laughs> position, my, position, my position on it and with some of the folks that I've spoke to, um, these as a recre for recreation here in Wellington North, um, they've got a lot of concerns with regards to it. Uh, firstly, we don't have any trails and these, some of these folks are folks that um, have our property owners out in the country and they're already having issues with snowmobiles, whether they allow the trail to go across their property or not. Um, so that's a huge concern uh, for me. I don't really want to have give people another reason to call me because of issues that, you know, that maybe we can limit. We don't have any trails. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's anybody interested in putting, you know, coming together to um, have a tourist destination with trails or to build these trails. And most of the time I would suggest that these vehicles are driven in the summer where they wouldn't be able to access necessarily the same routes that the snowmobiles uh, do over um, farmers' fields and and along those kinds of properties because that's when um, farming is at its best. The crops are up, or, or or what have you. So I don't support it. I think that the uh, folks that need to use them, can use them for bona fide farm use. And I think that that's the way it should stay. Okay. Any, any further discussion? If I can just clarify, any off-road vehicle, that if, if, if we do nothing, or we'll, Right now, they, legally, they can be on the roads because we haven't passed a bylaw to prohibit it. <clears throat> Any of these off-road vehicles that may enter private property, that's outside the scope of what, 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 what is permitted, and that's trespassing. It's different with snowmobile, and, and they're trespassing too if there's no trail there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just to clarify that, it, this, this only permits them to be on the roads. It doesn't permit them to be on anyone's private, on anyone's property. But I guess Lisa, I'm looking- Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, yeah, I did. <laughs> Sorry, can Karen, did you have something you wanted to add before I let Lisa start? No. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I don't know where to start. I mean, first of all, if people are trespassing, please call the police, don't call your counselor. I mean, it's a criminal act. Um, but do we have a communication plan for this? Because that's where I think the biggest problem might be is, is where to go, what the rules are. Like a 50, a 50 zone is not 50 for an ATV. A 50 is 30, right? And an 80 is 50, I believe. And you've got to be on the shoulder. So like, where do people access these rules? So we don't have 
chaos. <laughs> Uh, through you, your worship, we can we can do some media. We can do some social networking. Um, it it, uh, it I guess I would put it back. How do you know what your speed limit, or how do you know what the restrictions on driving a car is? At some point, it becomes your responsibility to know. Um, but but to your point, yes, we can we can put some social media out. Again, the problem is uh, people don't understand that it's a, an MTO road or a county road or a Minto road or a Wellington North road. And, um, but we, we can certainly do that. That's, that's something that, that we can do. I guess I'm wondering, sorry. No, go, go ahead, Karen, please. I, I'm wondering if we want this to come back to council, mm -hmm. what's the trigger? Do you want to direct today to bring this back or what's going to be the criteria to bring it back. Go ahead, Cherry. So again, this is something that keeps circling back. We have tried with the county to have the northern portion of the county, Minto, Mapleton, and us come up with some kind of resolve. That hasn't happened. Um, we through you, Mayor Lennox, we understand that the, ca the, the county is still gonna talk about this. I mean, when does, when does it end? So I guess I'm fine to have it come back after the county discusses it because that's the issue. We're on the list, Minto's not on the list. How do people know which road they can drive it on and which road they can't? Uh, it's not the same as a snowmobile or a vehicle. You can drive on, you can drive on down the county road to the next trip piece of trail. You can drive your vehicle on any road. I guess that's where I struggle to say, yes, let's just leave it. Okay. <clears throat> Lisa, did you have your hand up? Okay. Anybody else want to uh, participate in this? Uh, just, Karen, just, just to Councillor Burke's point, I did pull all of our minutes and 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 uh, reports, and this did start back in October, 2015. Uh, that's where the mayor brought a notice of motion that he wanted to discuss it. Uh, so that was at the September 28th meeting. And then it was uh, brought as a motion on the October 5th. And then a report was brought in November of 2015. Again, in April of 2016. Then on November 4th, 2019, uh, the open forum, it was discussed that uh, a, the Wellington County wasn't interested in considering ATVs on the road. So, so to your point, this has this does keep coming back. Yeah, and, and some of the delays with this were related to the fact that regulatory change was in the works. Correct. Um, I know that uh, there are members of county council that do want to discuss this again. So now that the regulatory change is in place, that's why I believe that we will be discussing it in the not too distant future. Good. Mike. Mayor Lennox, um, I think before we leave this conversation, the question I have for council is, do we care what the county decides? Uh, my sense is that we've got people who've made uh, made up their mind about ORVs, ATVs on Township of Wellington North Roads, no matter what the county does. So why don't we why don't we flush that out if that's the case? Well, if if we're not, uh, or does it cha does it change what we want ha happening on our roads if the county does or doesn't allow ORVs on their roads? Uh, from my perspective, the only issue to taking that approach is around the enforcement side of it. You know, 
do we want to make the OPP have to enforce a a menu of uh, issues around this issue, or do we want to try to make it as simple as possible? That's for me. That's the only issue in that regard. I don't know how everybody else feels, Steve. I think the only issue that I see, uh, Mike and, and Mayor Lennox, is like right down the road from me is County Road uh, 14. And then if you can go a little bit further, you can go to the Damascus Road. And could I legally drive down Side Road 7 East to the Con Road and then jump on the sixth line to go into uh, Damascus and then cross County Road 16 to go to the Luther Marsh? I think that's the that's why I'd, I'd like the county to get off get that part of their situation figured out so that it's not confusing for uh, residents that have farms from here to there and they have to cross county roads or provincial roads. I think that's the only stickler for me and I would, like I don't see any problem with this at all. I want them to have access to the roads in the municipality but kind of, I don't want them to get pinched on, uh, on the county roads either. Mike, go ahead. So to clarify, Councilor McCabe, if the county does not choose to allow them, we would change our position? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for all the council, but I think that, I don't know where we'd go from there if the county said, no, we don't want ROVs on the, ORV, sorry, on the, uh, on our county roads. And I think that's why we, hopefully the Northern um, municipalities, or at least, if we have to go it alone, maybe we go it alone and kind of annex uh, the county roads up here. That's, uh, I'm not sure what the county is going to do. I hope they make a decision soon so that we don't have to revisit this again. Okay. Just, just to add another fly in the ointment, uh, I get routine complaints, uh, particularly in Mount Forest, about uh, ATVs in particular, uh, traversing across township owned property that really is not a roadway um, and causing problems with that. I'd much sooner those ATVs remain on the roadway than to continue to be trespassing on inappropriate places, such as walking trails or our private property or even township owned property that really isn't conducive to their transit. I know that uh, on more than one occasion, and, and I'm not trying to single out Mount Forest in particular, but I've been in Mount Forest. Uh, it's been, you know, they're coming in from Gray County. So they often come down in the old railway bed on the, the northern end of Mount Forest. They come across and want to follow that railway bed, but a lot of it is in private property ownership. Some of it the township owns and it's causing disruption and safety issues. Um, I, I personally think that having them on the road would be better. Uh, whether this is going to guarantee that they're going to stay on the road or not is an open question. But if, we, if we're not going to do that, I will be pushing for us to take more concrete action to stop them from continuing to go across private property and even township owned property such as that rail bed. I've seen them come in that rail bed, come right down to Sligo Road on that rail bed, and then go on the what's now the public school property. To me, to me, that's way more inappropriate than being on our, our roads and, and town streets. And so for that reason, I think uh, for us to continue to prohibit them is just encouraging that continued behavior. And the police don't have the, uh, the time to be there all the time to police that. And the, the more it's prohibited, the more that kind of behavior continues. Uh, it's not a perfect solution, but I, for that, that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm in support of this is because we got to get these ATVs off of private property by whatever means we possibly can. And yes, there will still be trespassing, but I, to me, this is just another excuse for those ATV owners who, particularly the ones that want to ride the trails in Gray County, to to go across private property where they can hopefully stay out of sight of the OPP. I'd sooner have the OPP see them, police them for helmets and, and of speed and those types of things than have them continue to traverse both township owned property and private property. 
And yes, I'd like to see it be consistent, if at all possible, with county roads uh, being part of the, that solution. But I can't, at this point, predict how that's going to roll out. I mean, if, if we really are concerned about the, the future of this, then I think we should set a time to review it, whether it's nine months or a year from now, we're going to review it again and see what happens, or, uh, or we just carry on. Uh, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say it's it's fine for us to review it, and then to Mike's question, what happens if the county doesn't play ball, and where does that leave us? Do we just go on our own? Which I'm fine to do. Well, we're we're already on our own in a sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I right right now it's legal. Yeah. Okay, I'm fine with. We want to change the way it is. It's up. It's up to us. Yeah, I'm fine with it how it is. And, you know, I mean, if if you know, if a year from now or nine months from now or whatever, I, I'm not you know married to any particular timeline. If we see these things ripping down Main Street, I don't think that's something we want to see. You know, I could foresee us restricting where they could go on on some streets or you know and i'm just using that as an example but if it's not a problem then why create a bylaw to, to address something that isn't even a problem yet oh i totally agree with you and uh hopefully the county sees it that way too and gets moving on it <clears throat> lisa yeah i'm i'm in agreement with with leaving things the way they are as well um I'm hoping that when the county has their discussion, they will, I mean, if, if, if this is Wellington, what Wellington North wants to do, we'll bear that into mind and into whatever their decision is, I hope. Okay. Dan, you've been pretty quiet. Do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with the way the province has, has, has set this up. I mean, you're never going to, no matter what you do, whether the county gets on board or other municipalities get on board, no matter what we do, we're always going to, there's always going to be people that break the rules. But what you're saying is if it, if it is, if it is legal to do it, maybe that'll stop some of it. Maybe it'll slow it down. So, you know, I think we've got to give it a try and see what, see what happens. I don't know if once we try it, we can, we can uh, change it, but I think we need to see what it's going to do. We, we can absolutely change it mm -hmm. if we need to. Yeah. But I think you got to, we got to give it a try, but you're, you're always going to have people breaking the rules. It doesn't matter what we have in place for bylaws or enforcement abilities uh, or not abilities it, it, it you know you're, you're going to have rule breakers absolutely lisa yeah i i agree and i think um i don't think we're going to see a huge change to be honest I, I people are already going up and down the side road um on their atv but this will make it enforceable right so um I think it's, it's, it's the right move, but we could see some glitches along the way and we'll have to deal with that as they come. Okay. Any further comments <clears throat> at this point? Do you want to set, do you want to set a hard timeline, Sherry? No. Okay. Certainly, if there's issues that crop up with any time we can bring this back, it would just require a notice of motion and we can bring it back and further discuss it. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess we're down to calling the motion then. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. All right, that gets us to the end of our items for consideration, I think. We got that right, Karen? All right, so that uh, brings us to notice of motion. Any notice of motion this afternoon from anybody?
Okay. Seeing none, then we'll move on to community group meeting program report. And since everybody was hunkered down over the holidays, uh, I don't imagine there was too many group community group things happening, but uh, we'll look for any updates of things like that and uh, other things you council would like to share. Go ahead, Lisa. I actually did have one on December the 29th. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Mount Forest District Chamber of Commerce had to sneak in their annual general meeting uh, before the end of the year. Um, it had been delayed uh, due to everything that's going on. So I just wanted to just update you on that because, um, I, sorry, I hit mute. Um, we do have a new president um, of the Mount Forest District Chamber of Commerce. That's Krista Blankhorn. I'm sure you're all familiar with her from, uh, she's the HR manager at Vintex. And we also did bring on uh, three new directors. Um, so it's nice to see new people. We have Matt Lance um, from Graphite Design, Crystal Seifred um, from the Wellington Ad Advertiser and Kelly Demick from Cynthia and Company. And I guess to round out the board, I'll list the rest of them too. So, cause I had to swear them in, which was interesting, you know, over Zoom, but we, we did it. Um, Sharon Wanger from Coldwell Banker, Michelle Van Essen, uh, from Dufferin Mutual Insurance. And of course, Sean McLeod is now our past president again. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lisa. Anybody else of, of any of these? Uh, Sherry, go ahead. So in my hands, I don't wanna hold it up too high. In my hands, I have a check for $5,000 uh, for the Mount Forest Splash Pad. So the funding gap is now covered. We have the money to pay for the sign. So we're not going to, our sponsorship sign. So we're not going to have to rely on funds from the Mount Forest Lions Club. I received this check between Christmas and New Year's. So it was a very happy gift. Um, and that's all I have. Congratulations, Sherry. Wonderful news, Sherry. Thank you. Well done. <clears throat> okay, anybody have any others they'd like to uh, talk about today? No. I'm good. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything in particular at this point. Uh, certainly, the uh, pandemic is still with us and we're still learning to adapt to what that means as we go forward. And I'm sure we're gonna hear more in the next couple of days uh, um, from the Premier. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware, uh, but I just thought I'd mention it as well. We do meet with the Medical Officer of Health, uh, Dr. Mercer uh, on a periodic basis. And uh, she's, and, and of course, uh, everybody I think is probably aware that we have the first region outside of where there's major hospitals to have vaccine delivered to us and the initial doses of vaccine have been uh, allocated and there will be more coming. Uh, first priority of course is to those uh, uh, staff and residents of long-term care to try to get uh, ahead of some of the challenges that uh, those congregate care settings uh, are faced with. And as more vaccine comes and becomes available, there will be a bigger effort to, or bigger, sorry, a bigger challenge to get all of those uh, uh, doses of vaccine delivered to people. And we want to do what we can uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up, uh, particularly for council, because we may be asked as a township with both staff and council to support that effort because it will require a huge logistical and uh, staffing, uh, you know, uh, coordinated effort to get the vaccine into the arms of our residents. And, uh, and you know, you, if you start thinking about the numbers, uh, the, you know, the public health is used to doing vaccinations on a large scale, but not on anywhere near this kind of scale. So it's gonna require a lot more people, a lot more organization, a lot more logistics. So uh, I know that the uh, County of Wellington has offered some of their staff, uh, but we may need to uh, to pitch in, find a way to uh, support that effort as well to make sure that our residents are have access to that as soon as they possibly can. So 
stay tuned. I'm sure we'll have more discussion about it, but uh, it's, uh, you know, while we're talking pandemic stuff, this is pretty exciting. The prospect of getting our residents vaccinated and I think everybody's looking forward to that. Um, with that, that said, uh, I don't think I have anything else to add at this particular moment in time. So any questions or comments from anybody on any of those reports? I'm good. Okay, so let's move on to bylaws then. We have uh, uh, four bylaws to deal with, and uh, we have they're dealt with in one uh, recommendation here, which is great. Although I would like to discuss personally, would like to discuss at least one of these bylaws a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to say it's moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry, that bylaw numbers 001-21-002-21-003-21 and 004-21 be read a first, second and third time and enacted. And uh, so in there we have the, the normal annual temporary borrowing bylaw. We have the uh, normal annual uh, interim tax levy bylaw. And we have a, a bylaw to repeal an old bylaw to, to appoint a drainage superintendent, which I see is sadly out of date. And then the other one is our budget bylaw. And uh, I just want to draw some attention to that because I think it's the first time in my time on council that we've been able to pass a bylaw this early in, in the year to deal with budget. And uh, I wanted to extend my congratulations and, and uh, thanks to uh, everyone on the team for being able to make that happen. I think that's quite an accomplishment uh, to both council and staff. And uh, again, my, my hat's off to everyone for being able to make that happen. With that said, I'll open it up for other questions or comments. No, none here. Okay. I'm good. There. And then, and the other thing I would just like to add to that too is that I'm, I'm very uh, grateful that we have uh, a budget that is very close to a 0% increase. Uh, again, to recognize and, and respect the challenges that many of our residents and businesses are facing and will face for the remainder of 2021 at least. Um, but certainly we want to uh, do everything we can within our power to keep those small businesses afloat and keep them encouraged to continue to fight on through this challenging time. And I think this is uh, one thing we can do and have done. And uh, I'm again, very grateful for that. So with that said, uh, any final comments from anybody? Okay, call the motion then, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Uh, brings us uh, to our confirming bylaw, uh, moved by Dan, seconded by Lee. Everybody still hear me okay? Yep. yep. My headset just died. Uh, so confirming bylaw, moved by Dan, seconded by Lisa, that bylaw number 005-21 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North at its regular meeting held on January 11th. 2021 be read a first, second, and third time and enacted. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. And we have just adjournment. But before we move to adjournment, I would just like to draw your attention to the meetings, notices, and announcements uh, on in your agenda. Of course, the Mount Forest Chamber of Commerce Directors meeting January 12th at 7 p.m. The Arthur Chamber of Commerce Directors meeting January 13th at 5.30 p.m. and our next council meeting, uh, January 25th at 7 p.m. and the next park, Recreation Parks and Leisure Committee on uh, February 2nd at 8.30 a.m. With that said, we'll go, get on with adjournment. Moved by uh, Sherry, seconded by Steve, that the regular council meeting of January 11th, 2021 be adjourned at 4.33 p.m. All those in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>